Welcome to Series Shorts. I'm Ipsy, and on today's episode, we are discussing chapters 29 through 31 of A Discovery of Witches, written by Deborah Harkness. If you haven't seen the previous series shorts on this novel, go ahead and check those out for context. I'll have the first one linked down below, as well as the 50-minute deep dive on this section of the novel. There will be spoilers ahead. I don't keep any secrets for a future discovery, so consider this your spoilers warning. All right, let's get into it. Diana is carried away from Septur by a witch she doesn't recognize. She's taken to castle ruins owned by Gerbert, a witch, vampire, vampire. <laughs> She's taken to castle ruins owned by Gerbert, a vampire on the congregation. He, as well as Domenico, are there to greet the witches when they arrive. Remember, Domenico is the vampire that went to Septur to warn Matthew not to break the covenant. Diana learns the name of the witch that kidnapped her is Satu, another one of the congregation members. After the vampires leave, Satu begins to interrogate Diana. First, she tries to convince Diana that they're both on the same side, that she's just been under Matthew's thrall. It's not her fault she's confused. Satu informs Diana that she doesn't know her vampire as well as she thinks she does, and Satu's right. When she tells Diana that Matthew snuck into her rooms the night they met and that he killed Jillian for delivering photos of her dead parents, Diana is stunned. She begins to question Matthew's motives, but it doesn't make her any more inclined to help Satu or share her secrets with the witch. So Satu takes a different approach, using Diana's parents as a justification for why she should help the witches why she should work with them. She implies Diana's parents would be deeply upset if they were to know that she was canoodling with a vampire, choosing Matthew over witches, her own kind. Diana then remembers what Jillian told her about her parents. Satu doesn't deny that witches were involved in the murdering of her parents for their secrets. She even admits to being there when it happened. Potentially, she even participated, though the book doesn't specify whether she did or not. It becomes clear to Satu that Diana is not going to share what she knows willingly. She begins to open Diana up like her parents were opened up, drawing a magical circle on her back. It's in this moment that Diana discovers a new ability. She can see the dead. As Satu begins torturing her, Diana's able to see her mother in the courtyard, telling her to be brave. After hours of searching, Satu is no closer to finding Diana's secrets than she was when she began. In frustration, she puts Diana in the castle's oubliette, promising to return with reinforcements. While she's down there, Diana sees her mother's ghost once again. She fades between reality and memory as her mother begins to tell her a forgotten bedtime story from her childhood. It's a story of a princess wrapped in invisible ribbons by her fairy godmother. She wrapped the princess up in ribbons to protect her because while the princess was very good at magic, the fairy godmother knew that it would bring out jealousy in other witches. She told the princess that one day she would shrug the ribbons off, but until then, she wouldn't be able to make magic. Long after, the princess meets a prince who lives between the shadows of moonrise and sunset, and the two fall in love. Soon after, though, three witches come to town and suspect the princess of being more powerful than they are. So they spirit her away to a castle. Even though the witches pulled and tugged at her ribbons, they were unable to get the princess's ribbons off, so they locked her away in a room. Before her mother finishes the story, Diana passes out from exhaustion. The book then returns to Septur. Matthew, Marta, and Isabeau have been searching for Diana for over ten hours at this point. Isabeau, in desperation, calls Matthew's brother Baldwin, who is yet another member of the congregation. Just to make sure we're on the same page, so far we've met all three of the vampire congregation members, Gerbert, Domenico, and Baldwin, as well as two of the witch congregation members, Knox and Satu. Baldwin is furious at Matthew for breaking the covenant, but he's even more pissed that he broke it for a witch because of what the witches did to their father, Philippe, during World War II. See, the witches helped hide Philippe from his family while Nazi doctors experimented and tortured him. Baldwin refuses to help Matthew, so Matthew pulls out his trump card. Baldwin may be the head of the house, but Matthew is the head of the Knights of Lazarus. 
He proclaims that Diana is now under the protection of the knights and calls on his brother to perform his knightly duties and protect Diana. With Baldwin's help in the garden, they're able to figure out which direction Diana was taken, and Isabeau realizes that Gerbert has property in that direction. When Isabeau mentions that she suspects Diana of being spellbound, and that's why she's unable to protect herself, Matthew calls Diana's aunts in search of clarity. Diana's aunt Sarah is completely clueless, but Aunt Emily informs the vampires that she suspects that Diana's mother and father spellbound her when she was a child. Sarah and Emily are witches, and Emily's main ability is as a seer, and she tells the vampires that Diana is in some sort of castle ruins. It's the final puzzle piece that the vampires need in order to figure out where Diana is being held, at Gerbert's old castle, La Pierre. They head out in Baldwin's helicopter immediately. Diana's mother wakes her from her sleep. She has to finish the story before they run out of time. The princess was locked in a room, and she sat there for hours until she heard a knock at the door. It was her prince, but he was unable to help her escape. He couldn't break down the door or smash the windows. They were bewitched with magic, and he wasn't a witch. The princess is going to have to save herself. She looks down and sees a silver ribbon wound tightly around her. When she pulls on it, it comes loose. She throws the ribbon up towards a hole in the ceiling, and her body follows the ribbon up and out of the locked room and into the prince's waiting arms. It's then that Diana hears Matthew calling down to her. He can't climb down because they would both be stuck. Diana has to find a way to get herself out. Diana looks around for a ribbon, but there isn't one. With her parents and this part always gets me. With her parents' encouragement, she imagines a ribbon into place and throws it up to the entrance of the oubliette. Just like the story, she's able to fly and escape her imprisonment. Matthew carries Diana back to Baldwin's helicopter and they all arrive safely back at Septour. Okay, so how does this section of the book compare to its TV show adaptation? Some of it's fine, some of it's not, and some of it is truly great. But before we get into that comparison, there are a few background characters I have to discuss. First, we have Domenico and Gerbert. Now, as far as the book is concerned, this is all we see of these characters. Domenico delivers the message from the congregation, and then both Domenico and Gerbert are present when Satu brings Diana to La Pierre. Unfortunately, the show decides to give them both a much more elaborate backstory than I think is necessary. Basically, Domenico discovers that Gerbert's daughter, Juliette, killed a man in Venice and tells Gerbert about it. He punishes Juliette by throwing her in a dungeon cell. Then, Domenico finds out from Satu that Matthew is pursuing a witch. He goes to Gerbert once more because Gerbert is kind of like the vampire governor of Venice and encourages Gerbert to use the information to bring down the de Clermonts once and for for all. Both vampires are not a fan of the de Clermont family. Gerbert is skeptical of this information, but sends Juliet to investigate all the same. Now, let's talk about Satu. In the books, she's been on the congregation for potentially decades, at least since Diana was seven and her parents were murdered. In the show, we are introduced to Satu when Knox goes to recruit her for the congregation, but before they head to Venice to swear her in, Knox brings Satu with him to Oxford to follow Diana. She's there when Knox has tea with Diana and even confronts her during one of her runs, accusing Diana of being connected to Ashmole 782 somehow. We see Satu go to the congregation for the first time. While she's there, she takes the opportunity to look into the bishops. Her curiosity peaked after her run-in with Diana. This is how Domenico finds out about Diana. He catches Satu in the witch archives researching her. During Satu's research, she discovers that it was Knox who tested Diana for magical aptitude when she was a child. She confronts Knox, and he overpowers her with the use of his black ball, threatening to crush her, literally, unless she stops questioning him. He says he brought her onto the congregation to work with him, not against him. Personally, I don't mind this reinvention of the character. It's beneficial later in the story to have Satu be this new member of the congregation with the ability to look at it with a more critical eye than Satu from the books. We just didn't need as much of a backstory as they gave us. I'd say keep Satu in the library just to acknowledge that Knox recognizes her and also keep her confrontation with Diana because that's what motivates her to look into the bishops. Bishops. <laughs> 
That's what motivates her to look into the bishops and discover that Knox has been involved with the family for years. The show also includes congregation meetings regarding Diana and Ashmole 782. This is one of my favorite adaptation choices by the writers. I love almost every moment they added from the congregation meetings. With this new addition and view into the congregation's inner workings, however, I think that a lot of the additional information that we get from the backstories could have easily been sprinkled in to this part of the adaptation. All of the necessary plot motivators could have easily happened in that space. So, that brings us back to this episode's plot. Like the book, Satu kidnaps Diana from Septour and brings her to LaPierre. Satu first tries to talk Diana into giving up her secrets. When that doesn't work, she tries to open Diana up. Now, a big deviation that the show takes is how this magic affects Satu. In the book, she's fine, but the show establishes with a conversation between Nox and Satu that a spell as powerful as an opening spell is more than likely to cause major damage, not only to the witch experiencing it, but also the witch casting it. This comes to fruition for Satu. She ends up losing her powers trying to find Diana's secrets. She still puts Diana in the oubliette, but without her powers, she's vulnerable to Gerbert. Satu eventually escapes, but that's a story for anyone who wants to watch the deep dive video. Speaking of stories, it's time for Diana's ghostly mother to retell her the bedtime story from her childhood. Except in this section, the show deviates significantly from the book. Instead of Diana's awareness slipping between the oubliette and her memories as a child, the show puts Diana in a black box with her parents. It's such a weird choice. I get why they did it. Throughout the show, we witness Diana dream about spiderwebs. It's their way of representing the fact that Diana is spellbound. So now that she's escaping her bindings, they have to bring the spiderwebs back somehow. This scene is one of my favorites from the book. It had me ugly crying when I read it, every time I've read it. Unfortunately, the show's virgin, virgin, oops. <laughs> Unfortunately, the show's version is just confusing. Why is she in a box? Where did her parents come from? She's not even emotional or excited to see them after 20 years. Diana looks about as confused as I felt watching it play out. It would have been easy for the show to juxtapose Diana in the oubliette with a child version of her talking to her parents. They even have a similar scene in the very next episode. They wouldn't have even needed to use CGI to make her parents look like ghosts. Just show a shot every once in a while of Diana responding to the conversation happening in her memories. It's just a bummer that a scene that held so much weight and had such an impact in the book falls so flat in the show. I hope you enjoyed this series short. Feel free to leave a comment or hit the like button and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.